Olvis Croft and Boldwood presents A Cottage Full of Secrets, written by Jane Lovering and read by Rose Robinson. The moral right of the author has been asserted. This performance is owned by Boldwood. Chapter 1 Stella, September 1973 I can't bear it. I can't bear that I'm going to have to leave my cosy, lovely little house. I'd done the garden up all nice and got the first harvest of beans in, too. He's right. I can't be the kind of wife he wants me to be. I forget things. I put things in the wrong places. I can't keep the place clean. Now I don't want to touch anything in case I get it wrong. I'm scared to tidy because it's not right, or I arrange the drawers all back to front and what I clean is not enough or too much, or I use the wrong cloth. So now all I can do is walk around looking at everything I made to turn this into a nice home for us. I have to make a choice. Stay and keep being wrong all the time, or leave when everyone has done so much for us. I know he loves me. I know he does. But last night I was afraid of him, even when I knew what he was saying was right. I can't bear it to keep being like this, but on the other hand, I can't keep on letting him down. Everyone's going to be so disappointed in me for not sticking it out. I mean, that's what you do, isn't it? You stand by your man. I'm making him unhappy and angry all the time. So I've decided. I've backed up as many of my things as I can. Just some clothes and bits. And I've hidden the suitcase down in the ruins of the old house. He'll never think to look there. I'm going to get the bus to Kirkby, just like I would on a normal market day to do the shopping. Then I'm going to go to Jeanette's house. I'm going to tell her everything and hope she'll help me. Her dean has a car and he could come up one day and pick up my suitcase if I tell him where it is. I can't take it on the bus. Someone might see and tell him and he might get to me before I can get away. It's hidden. He won't find it and spoil all my best things like he does sometimes when he's in a mood. Once I've got my stuff, I'll go to Auntie Evelyn's. I can get the bus from Pickering down to York and stay there until Auntie can talk to Mum and Dad. They're going to be so disappointed in me. We've never had a divorce in the family and the wedding was so expensive. I'm not sure Dad's finished paying it all off yet. But, in the meantime, I can stop with Auntie Evelyn and she's always saying how she could get me a job up in Round Trees with her. She won't mind me being separated from my husband. Dad always says she's far too modern for her own good. But if I tell her how I'm just not good enough to stay married, how I keep letting him down and how I haven't dared ask Dad about the house deeds yet, and if I tell her about the pictures, well, I think she'll be on my side. But I hate having to leave. I love my little house, the peace and quiet with the birds singing and sometimes the foxes and badgers running out over the fields. I'd got it all cosy and nice. I'd just finished recovering the settee again. It's funny, but it was the settee that made up my mind. I really liked that yellow stripy material which made the room look all bright and sunny. But he said it was horrible and it made his eyes hurt. He said I'd better do it again in a nicer colour and I was to show it to him first before I started. I was so busy saying sorry that I forgot he'd been watching me do all the sewing every evening, making all the covers. It was only when it was finished that he decided he didn't like it. But he could have said. Could have stopped me wasting all those weeks stitching and making my fingers sore because I can't find the thimble and daren't ask him because he'd shout at me for losing it. It was when I knew. Anyway. I'd better get my face on before I go. There's a bruise over my eye and Bob will be driving the Wednesday bus and I know he will notice if I don't get my foundation right. I have to be gone before he gets back and finds out what I've done. I broke open the door to his wardrobe this morning. The door was locked and I don't know where he keeps the key, so I took the little axe that we used to chop up the wood for the fire. I chopped, chopped chopped my way into that wardrobe until it was splinters and jagged old bits of wood. Then I got the axe again and I chopped into his suitcase 
because that was locked as well, and I put the lock down on the fire. I'm not supposed to light the fire, with it being warm, but I've stopped caring what he'll say now. And I burnt all of them. It's a strange feeling, not caring. I've cared so much for the last two and a half years. Cared and tried and tried so hard to do everything right. But now I feel like I'm lighter. Like I'm going to be able to go back to doing all the things I loved before. Dancing and seeing my friends and mum and dad. So it sort of doesn't matter that I'm not a good wife. Because I can go back to being someone's daughter and someone's friend. I'm going to get my life back. Chapter 2 The two cottages stood comfortably together where the track petered out into tire marks and dust, like a couple of plump maiden aunts at the end of the world. One had curtained windows, a neatly lawned garden, and a front door with a large No Callers sign drawing pin to it, curling around the edges. I pulled my car onto the verge in front of the other cottage, where the bare windows gave the place a vaguely surprised air, like overplucked eyebrows. As the car engine ticked itself cool, I looked for the first time at my new home and sighed. From his cage in the boot, Brack yipped impatiently. Yes, all right, I'm getting out. Look, this is me, getting out. I opened the car door and put one foot out onto the mud of the verge. A wind so cold as to almost be brittle snapped around me and I hastily retreated to the warmth inside the car, carefully built up over hundreds of miles of my tuneless singing and mint imperials. In a minute, just let me take in the scenery. In fact, there was nothing particularly scenic about the view. I'd been assured by the estate agent's website that the cottage offered a panoramic view of the Yorkshire Moors, but this was not currently evident. All it offered from here was a view of a gravelled-over front yard containing some pots of dead, dry stuff, the muddy lane, and then, over the other side, a thorny hedge. Welcome to Yorkshire, I muttered. To be fair, my vision of Yorkshire thus far had been gleaned from the tourist brochures, which had mostly featured Whitby and a lot of heather. There had also been quite a lot about fish and chips. Apart from a clump of purple flowers on the far bank, None of these things had so far been in evidence, so I was already inclined towards disappointment in my destination. Brack yipped again and dug at the side of his cage. I turned around to make sure he wasn't hurting his paws in his desperation to be out of the metal box that had contained him for longer than he was used to, and when I turned back, there was a man standing at my car window. He had his arms folded in the age-old, what do you think you're doing here, posture and an unshaven face that was not wearing a welcome to the neighbourhood, ear of fresh-baked goodies and a timetable for the local rubbish collection expression. His sudden arrival made me jump. Still, there was nothing to be gained by antagonising the natives, so I wound down my window half an inch and smiled cautiously up at him. Hello? He squinted into the car. That's a fox, he said. My immediate instinct was to say, Oh my God, it was a spaniel when I put it in the car. What kind of witchcraft is this? But I didn't. I just said, Yes, I know. Because I did. And then, because I was worried that I'd sounded a little short, and I'd learnt to always account for my movements, I've just bought the cottage I'm moving in today. We've come up from Cornwall. Horrible little staccato sentences, but the non-reaction of the man at my window was beginning to worry me. He could be planning anything, from ripping me from the driver's seat and hurling me over the hedge to, well, actually, I had no idea. Apart from the generalised frown, his expression was giving nothing away. Maybe he'd been overcome with mint imperial fumes. I cautiously pressed the button to lock my door and hoped he hadn't seen me do it. This is Yorkshire, he said, finally, 
as though he believed that I might have taken a wrong turn up the M5 and currently be labouring under the belief that this was Taunton. There was a pause in which I neither confirmed nor denied that, yes, this was indeed Yorkshire, and I was at the correct destination. That's a long way from Cornwall. Yes, I said, again stating the absolutely obvious. My lack of witty repartee brought our conversation to a close. With another squint into the car, the man unfolded his arms and began to walk away, back toward the house with the unwelcoming sign tacked to the door. He stopped just before the gate, looked at me and said, I hope your furniture lorry isn't going to block the lane. I need to go out in an hour. Then he was gone, closing his front door behind him with an echo that seemed to indicate that the inside of his house was devoid of anything except him and his attitude. I looked at Brack, and Brack looked at me. Well, I said, but had nothing to follow up with. From somewhere behind came the sound of a van struggling its way up the unpaved lane, lurching over the ruts and through the winter puddles that were just starting to dissipate under the spring sun. The acceptable bits of the rest of my entire life were heaving into view, rolling like a tea clipper in a gale and probably smashing all my china in the process. I couldn't stall any longer. I had to get out of the car and open the door before the removal man left all my furniture in the front garden. Brack's amber eyes followed me through the gate, up the mossy path and to the front door. I could feel them. He was pretty sanguine for a fox, but even he would be wondering what the hell was going on and what I meant by ripping him from his nicely established territory in the back garden of our house near Truro and relocating to the wilds of Yorkshire. I couldn't even begin to explain, especially not to a fox. The front door creaked aside and let the rays of sun come past me straight into the room, like an opportunistic salesman. The puff of air that met me smelt old. Of old things in old rooms. Dust and furniture polish and warm wood, and the frosty smell of somewhere that needs the windows to be opened more often. The front door opened directly into the living room. Ahead of me was another door which led to the staircase and was slightly ajar, giving a tantalising glimpse of a steep, narrow flight leading upwards. Beyond, on the ground floor, lay the bathroom and the kitchen at the back. I'd memorised the estate agent's particulars, since that had been all I had to go on as I'd bought this place without ever seeing it in real life. Somewhere, out past the kitchen, there was a garden. And, presumably, this much-vaunted view of the moors, although, as the estate agent had clearly had to stretch themselves descriptively to cover the ground floor, Extensive living area leading to private bath and toilet, given on to comfortable farmhouse-style kitchen. I wasn't holding my breath. There wasn't much else you could say. Not a right angle in the place sounded woefully prejudicial, if accurate. All the pictures had been those optimistically stretched ones that had made the place look like a goldfish bowl with impossible perspectives. The external pictures had been taken in deep winter, and shown mostly grey skies. A cutting frost, and the cottage bleakly deserted. I walked through, surprised at the length of the living room, the location of the private bathroom, and the size of the kitchen at the back. The sun shone through and showed me the garden, long and thin, rolling slightly downhill to fields at the back. Over the threadbare hedge, I could see the top half of Mr. Misery sullenly pegging out washing on a hideous rotary line, which put me off going out to explore, and I turned around to see the removals men struggling my sofa in through the narrow front door. It's all labelled, I said helpfully, as they tilted the sofa at an improbable angle to get it to fit inside. The first removal man looked at me over his shoulder with a distinct lack of enthusiasm. It had been a long drive, though. It's the size of our little un's doll's house. I think we'll work it out, dear. You put the kettle on, we'll have you sorted. I found myself halfway to the kitchen before I remembered why I was here. Remembered that I'd promised myself not to jump to comply with a man's every whim. That was not who I was now. 
I'll leave the tea bags and milk here, I said, sidling past them as the sofa finally slid into the room like a difficult berth. You help yourselves. I'm going to get Brack, the fox, out of the car. The two men exchanged a look that told me they'd got me down as bonkers single woman with exotic pet, and sighed, but I nipped past and back down the slippery verge to the car, where Brack was sitting up in his travel cage, paws neatly together, and an expression of patient incomprehension on his pointed little face. He wasn't a pet, but I couldn't begin to explain the complicated relationship the fox and I shared. Not to two men who struggled with three-dimensional geometry and spatial awareness. Brack, me, the whole of the past five years. All stuff that I wasn't going to even start to put into words. Not yet. This cottage was my new beginning. A small, narrow-doored and inconspicuous one. But mine. Chapter 3 After the removal men had gone, I was filled with the urge to make the cottage mine. I had spent an unreasonable amount of time and money in the last few weeks on house renovation magazines and interior design websites. Of course, these had all featured 18-bedroomed houses in picturesque places like Berkshire, with handy little local emporiums selling exquisite artisan furniture, and usually a stream in the garden. This was more of a bargain basement version, I thought, as I stared around at the bare floors, two bedrooms and a puddle on the patio. But there was still a lot I could do with it. For example, the fireplace. Someone had fitted a modern log-burning stove with a fire surround in shades of old pond water meets silage clamp, with swirly tiles like a muddy Rorschach test. That needed to go, but a few experimental tugs told me that I'd need proper equipment. A bit of rocking and my fingernails were not going to do it. It was so hideous, I was almost prepared to take to it with my shoe and a chair leg, but restrained myself. Then there were the floorboards. They could be treated and polished, and with a few coats of paint more colourful than the present magnolia, the whole place would have more character. I stood back and stared again. Yep, there was a lot I could do. But then the words I'd heard so often over the previous years echoed in my ears. Really, darling? You don't have much of an eye for colour, do you? And that table... Far too big for the space. You're not going to buy that, are you? It's dreadful. All said in a tone that I'd heard as loving, as creative. Words I'd reassured myself weren't meant to hurt me, but to stop me making expensive mistakes. But that was then. This was now. I could paint this cottage purple if I wanted to. Take up the floorboards and lay fake grass indoors. Leave the fireplace where it was and decorate it with glitter. Hang a disco ball from the ceiling beams. I thought of the reaction to that and grinned to myself. Then I went and made another cup of tea. My first night in the cottage was strange. I had electricity. The estate agent had arranged to have that turned back on for me. But I couldn't find the stopcock to turn on the water so I was having to ration the water in the tank in the loft. Once that was empty, that was it. I went to bed unshowered, feeling itchy with sweat from moving furniture into the most appropriate places. While the removals men had put it into the rooms, they dumped it all in the middle and I spent most of the evening shoving beds and tables into workable locations. My room, the front bedroom, was so small that once the bed was in, the chest of drawers had to stay on the landing. The back bedroom, larger and looking out over the garden, was going to be my office, as it would, presumably, be quieter. Quieter. Ha! I lay in bed and listened to the silence whistling in my ears, broken only by Brack's occasional shift and whine. Until I got him a run built outside, he was overnighting in the bathroom, where the easy clean floor would hopefully not smell too badly. Brack was a wonderful companion but unhouse trainable and the smell of fox tended to get everywhere. There was the odd bump and thud from the wall that connected me with Mr. Next Door, too. The walls were thick, 
The cottages were old enough to have been built when two feet of solid stone was put between neighbours, and I hadn't heard a whisper from him all evening. No TV blaring, no resounding farts, no voices muted just below the level of hearing the actual words, so all you heard was a mutter and half-shouted laughter. None of that. Just the isolated clonks from the wall. I wondered, as I lay in the absolute darkness, with the familiar duvet pulled up around my ears, what that dark man with the grey streaked stubble was doing in there, and whether I dared knock on his door tomorrow to ask where the stopcock was for my cottage, or whether I'd just wash in buckets of rainwater from now on. He hadn't been exactly friendly, and I'd been slightly disconcerted to find that my neighbour was a man who appeared to be single, even if that single status was unsurprising given his general air of unwelcoming irritability. I pulled the duvet higher. He wasn't anything to do with me. I could just ignore him. Plus, he might actually have a wife or girlfriend who'd just gone to visit her mother or was on a shopping trip to somewhere with actual shops. Or perhaps he had a boyfriend. And anyway, I'd probably hardly ever see him. After all, he must work, mustn't he? I restlessly heaved to face an unfamiliar wall. No streetlights, no traffic. It was like sensory deprivation, only dustier and with more magnolia paintwork. I never thought I would find myself missing the seagulls that had squawked and stomped on my roof at all hours, or the endless trundle of traffic on the hill outside. And everything else? Did I miss that? I didn't know. A resounding no came first to mind, but then the good things came crowding in, stamping and stumbling over the bad so that my heart ached with loss and my dreams were full of tears. I slept and woke in stuttered sections through the night to a final waking with the early sun sliding in through the curtains that had been left in the house by the previous occupants, along with some isolated bits of furniture and a stupendously impractical cooker. I sat up in bed and stifled the flash of claustrophobia. This was it now. This five-roomed house perched against its neighbour in the wilderness of fields, with frantically singing birds outside and the rustle of wind in the treetops. Thinking of the neighbour made me realise that I was going to have to grit my teeth and knock on his door and ask about the stopcock. But first, I got up and went down to the kitchen, where I used bottled water to make myself a fortifying cup of tea. Then I went and had a look around my new property. Both cottages had a patch of land at the side, presumably where previous cottages had once formed a small terrace. The estate agent had called it a paddock, with the possibility of extension, subject to planning permission. But on the evidence, only if you wanted to build a conservatory in which to breed giant carnivorous plants. My paddock had a huge tangle of overgrown brambles in the middle, a skein of ragged twigs menacingly groping for the sky forming a clump so dense that the whole thing had a look of a Doctor Who monster about it. Amid this, there was a hint of a wall still standing, jutting the occasional brick through the tendrils of snagging growth, looking like a drowning arm sticking above the water. I gave it a cursory examination. No doubt it would be a useful space, as soon as I got hold of a flamethrower and weed killer so strong it was banned on four continents. The other side, next to the other cottage, the patch of land was cleared, neatly fenced and contained a wooden, open-fronted garage. Funny, I thought. My neighbour hadn't looked like the sort of man who would go in for tidy fencing. He'd definitely given me more of the razor wire and landmines vibes, with his antisocial stare and folded arms. Plus his eerie silence last night. That wasn't natural either. I wondered if I'd upset him with my noisy furniture arranging and off-key singing. Although, if I didn't find out about the stopcock soon, it wouldn't be the noise that would be upsetting him. It would be the general air of fetid human and enclosed fox seeping through the brickwork. Even his back garden looked miserable. No patches of fresh earth newly planted with summer bedding plants or fruit trees beginning to show signs of blossom just a glum brick path down the centre of a rather ragged lawn, a washing line and the half hedge that separated our gardens, and looked as though my side hadn't been clipped for several years. 
His side looked as though he periodically opened the gate and let the cattle in for a chew. My garden at least had a patio set on the flat, flagged area near the back door, and a couple of rather truncated rose bushes at the end near the wall. There was still no sign of the moors. Just fields dipping down over the horizon, and then a grey clouded sky rising up, dappled like the coat of a giant beast. From where I stood, halfway down my garden path, I could see into the kitchen window of next door. And just at the point I noticed this, Mr. Misery walked into the kitchen, glanced up and, before I had a chance to turn and look elsewhere, saw me. Our eyes met and I uncomfortably noted that his were very dark, almost shadowed. This was not the kind of detail I wanted to notice about my neighbour. I'd have been happy sticking to acknowledging that he seemed short-tempered and oddly silent. I definitely did not want physical characteristics to loom to the forefront. But there we are. He was male and he had dark eyes. Awkward at the observation, as well as being caught in a position to make it. I gave him a weak smile, and the kind of wave you do when you know you've been seen doing something horribly embarrassing, and sincerely hope that the observer will never mention it again. He stood for a second right by the window. Unlike my kitchen, he must have his sink there, because he was filling a kettle. I saw it as he swung it out from under the tap, using the opportunity to glare at me. His dark eyes imbued the glare with a degree of menace he perhaps didn't mean, but I wasn't going to risk it. I stopped waving. He turned his back and walked out of sight. In case he was going to burst out of the back door waving an iron bar and yelling, I straightened up and hurried back indoors, deciding that I could put off asking about the stopcock for a little while longer. Until he forgot about my bizarre staring through his window, anyway. A fortnight might do it. Except that I needed to clean. Brack had sprayed his intent to own the entire bathroom fairly liberally, and even with tiled walls, it needed to be scrubbed off pronto before it sank into the wooden bath surround. I sighed into the quiet, and loneliness draped itself over my shoulders again, like an enthusiastic old friend saying hello. But Brack, at least, was pleased to see me when I released him from his isolation and yipped around me for a few minutes, tripping me up and generally being annoying. Get out from under my feet, you crazed vulpine! I found myself snapping, trying to climb over the excited ball of russet fur to mop at the tiles with some of the disinfectant wipes I kept for the purpose. I might as well have been annoyed with the toilet system for all the good it did. Brack had no ability to judge my mood from my tone. My mere presence was enough for him and the fact that I fed him regularly would keep him twirling his complicated moves until he fell over. Owning a fox, it turned out, was less like a Disney movie and more like having a toddler on a permanent additive binge. All right. I gave in and went through to the kitchen, where I opened the fridge, put some pieces of meat in my hand, and then threw them. Raw meat carved a delicate arc through the air, and then met the uncarpeted floor with a splat and a scatter, which sent Brack into a fury of chasing, rolling and digging, until he had found, worried and swallowed each one. But at least it gave me a window of opportunity for another hunt for the stopcock. I went back into the smelly bathroom, wrenched open the stuck plywood door to the immersion tank, and shone my phone torch into the depths. This was my last-ditch attempt. I'd looked everywhere else that a stopcock might reasonably have been expected to be sighted. Inside the cupboard, a modern-looking timer ticked away behind the grey fluff. I leaned further in and poked my torch as far around the squat tank as it would go, and then laughed at the image I had of myself as someone trying to hug R2-D2. The fox, who'd obviously cleared the floor of meat and now regarded my crouching as an invitation to play, leapt onto my back. His little feet, like cushions of needles, dug into my spine and made me jump. Then I dropped the phone. The torch continued to shine behind the tank, a little beacon in the fusty depths of the cupboard. I could see its light but couldn't reach it, even if I stretched my arm in as far as it would go. And then, of course, of course, it started to ring. 
I nearly dislocated my shoulder but couldn't do any more than touch the outside of the casing with the very tips of my fingers and sort of scrabble at it like a zoo animal struggling for freedom. When the phone stopped ringing, I gave up the feeble rummaging, dislodged the fox who was trying to eat my collar and went in search of helpful items. Unfortunately, as I hadn't got round to unpacking much more than the vital essentials, all I had to hand was a fork, the packaging from last night's microwave dinner, and a cereal box. The tank itself was no help, squatting smugly amid its dust and fluff, as though it were perversely enjoying the fondling. This tank, I thought, gritting my teeth at it, was going to get the same treatment as the hideous fireplace if it wasn't careful. The phone had fallen face down, so the torch was shining upwards, illuminating the top of the tank cupboard with a fan of light dissipated through falling dust. I continued to poke, stretch and fumble, squeezed tightly in against the tank, which I was sure was smirking over my shoulder, with my arm bent at an improbable angle. The fork was squashed between my first two fingers, and I was using it to try to claw the phone close enough to grasp without any notable success. There was, however, a lot of dust and hot piping, and I was alternating sneezing viciously with exclaiming, Ow! Ow! which was driving Brack into a state of frenzy. Eventually I sat back and regarded my illuminated tank with despair. This was not how I'd imagined my first day in my new house. Tears pressed behind my eyes as I slumped against the door to the airing cupboard, with a delighted Brack clambering onto my lap to stare expectantly into my face. I'd anticipated walking through rooms, picking out colours from an online chart of expensive paints, rearranging the furniture to give room accents and pops of colour, and gazing out at the garden planning a planting scheme. Not one edition of Ideal Home magazine mentioned the possibility of lying on the bathroom floor armed with a fork, sneezing, shrieking and swearing with an overexcited fox whittling on the fixtures. Brack blinked at me and jumped off my leg to go and search for any leftover bits of meat. I sat for a moment longer. The tiled floor was cold and smelt of fox, but then, to be honest, so did pretty much everything I owned. I needed that stopcock. I needed my phone. And so, with a huge sigh that buckled the MDF of the cupboard, I went back to scrabbling. Eventually, I caught the tines of the fork in the base of the cupboard, which turned out to be slightly loose. By jabbing and dragging, I managed to dislodge the board the phone was on and, muttering, don't fall off, don't fall off, tow it slightly closer to my fingertips. This enabled me to clutch the very corner of the phone case and rescue it from the back of the immersion tank. I had to drop the fork in order to do so, but that was collateral damage I was prepared to take. I had other forks, but only one phone. So now I had my phone back in my hand, a bruised elbow, one fewer fork, and a fox who was trying to take up floorboards in the living room. Oh, and a missed call from the estate agency, which I returned in case they were phoning to tell me that they had forgotten that they had sold me a cottage with no stopcock and an immersion tank that was probably going to tiptoe upstairs in the night and try to get into bed with me. Sorry, no, trilled the young man on the other end. Just a courtesy call to make sure you got possession and moved in all right. I stared around at the magnolia walls from my position on the bathroom floor. Well, I'm here, I said. How all right it is remains to be seen. Are you positive there's no information about the stopcock? Let me check again. There was a moment of covered phone fumbling, far too short for him to have dug out anything on the cottage, and I suspected he was just kicking the underside of the desk to make suitable computer noises. No, nothing here, I'm afraid. Why don't you ask the neighbour? because he thinks I'm spying on him through his windows already, I didn't want to say. He's out, was all I could think to say. Was all I could think of. Yes, and left early this morning. Oh, the voice went up the register a bit further. Oh, well, his name's Ewan McGillan, by the way. We sold him that house a couple of years ago. You know, just in case you wanted to know or anything. Is it? I said dryly. Your place has been a holiday cottage, 
rented out for, oh, for years. Yes, the elderly couple who owned it died and some cousin has inherited it and needed to sell, so we were glad you came along when you did. Not everyone wants to live in the middle of nowhere in a house that hasn't seen a proper clean since Elton John was a lad. Darren. I heard the voice from his end of the phone. What have I said about too much information? That it's a bad thing in an estate agent, Dad? Right. And what are you doing? I'm just... Look, I'm going to have to go. Darren lowered his voice to a whisper. Just checking you were in, and, and you are, so... He hung up abruptly, leaving me staring at the phone. I knew the house hadn't been occupied for a while, but I hadn't known it had been a holiday cottage. I looked at the walls again. It would explain the slightly soulless nature of the decor, the lack of fitted carpets and the random left-behind furniture. At least now I knew the name of my miserable next-door neighbour too. Ewan McGillan. Not that it mattered, because I was going to carry on calling him Mr Misery in my head and I didn't think I'd ever get close enough to him to use his actual name. I stared at the phone, then I stared at the airing cupboard. I wavered for a minute. Should I reclaim my fork now, or leave it to gather generational dust? Sod it. What else did I have to do with my time? I inched a bit closer, pressed my bosom against the tank, which I was sure was leering, and stretched my other arm around the far side fingers wriggling in an attempt to touch the fork handle. My groping fingers found the edge of the loose board first, and then something else, something that jutted upwards as though it had been trapped under the board. It felt springy, flat and thin and plasticky. Intrigued, I scissored my fingers until I caught the thing between them, then gently withdrew my arm, trying not to scold myself against the hot water pipe again. It was an oblong of white card, slightly bent, like a little paper bridge. I let it ping onto my lap. It could at least have had the decency to be a roll of fifty-pound notes, or a treasure map or something that warranted me digging like brack among the floorboards. Disappointed, I dusted at the card, which sprang up and flipped over, revealing itself to be a photograph. Details ghostly and faded from being stuffed under the floor in a hot cupboard. I got up and went into the living room, where Brack had curled up on the newly installed rug and was eyeing me with his usual foxy disdain. I found something, I told him, although he didn't seem interested. It's a picture. Yep, still no reaction, other than a twitch of the tail. Brack was fed up and letting me know it. Where, he seemed to be saying in every line of his smooth russet coat, is the large outdoor run I was promised. Where are the digging opportunities? The mice? This is not what I expected when you shut me in the metal box for hours. And I am not happy. An ear twitched in my direction. I am, in fact, disconsolate. In my head, Brack talked like Oscar Wilde, in a slightly plummy, upper-class voice, and used archaic vocabulary. I had no idea why. I'll sort your run out soon, promise. If foxes could sniff in a haughty way, Brack would have done so. Instead, he just tucked his nose further under his tail. I took the photograph closer to the small front window and tilted it to catch a glimmer of the dull grey light that was coming in. Two foot thick walls were great for the actual structure of the house, nice and solid, good window seat, no noise from next door but they did mean that the windows were small and overhung. Light got in, but it didn't stream, it trickled. The photo was very faded. It had white bordered edges like the pictures that my mum and dad had in their old albums, surrounding a picture of a young woman in a garden, all overwashed with that slightly orange tone that I presumed was the byproduct of age and being shoved under the floor. She was standing, looking slightly awkward, in front of a large flowering bush. Her hands cupped in front of her in traditional I-don't-know-what-to-do-with-my-arms style. Her hair was long and loose and slightly curly, and she wore an ankle-length skirt in a fabric with huge circles on it. They may have been purple, 
but the slight sepia tinting made them look like dried blood. Her chin was up in an attitude of pride, but her eyes weren't looking at the photographer. She was focusing somewhere over his shoulder, so whatever was making her smile, it wasn't the person taking the picture. I turned it over again. With the improved light, I could see a faint pencil impression on the white card of the back. There was not much of the actual lettering left, but the indentation was visible if I tilted it the right way. Stella, June 1972. I flipped it back over again and made a face. 1972. That was practically historical. My mum would have been eight and dad five in 1972, and any time before I was born existed in my head in a kind of black and white unreality. I knew the world had been there. I'd seen films, TV programmes, my mum's family album and all that. But somehow in my head, everything that happened before my birth hadn't been properly formed. Maybe a family had stayed in the house and left a picture that had gradually been swept into the most inaccessible part of the cottage. I looked at it again. That woman, girl, really, she didn't look more than early twenties, would be in her, what, seventies now? If the picture had been that important, someone would have come back to look for it. Nobody had missed it since 1972, so I was probably free to throw it away. Right now, I had more pressing concerns than an old photograph. There was the absence of a fork, for a start, and then the stopcock mystery needed solving, even if that did mean going next door. Maybe I could push a note through the letterbox? With a long stick? From Lancashire? Behind me, Brack stretched, yawned, and got up to saunter towards the door. Then he peed on it. I really needed to find that stopcock. Chapter 4 Later, I drove cautiously into town. I had an odd, dislocated feeling driving along the roads where the hedges didn't loom over single-track roads from high banks. Here in Yorkshire, the roads, narrow as they were, ran along the edges of big, wide fields, feathery green with sprouting barley. The sky wasn't squeezed into glimpses of cloud or blue between hilly horizons. Instead, it curled overhead and seemed limitless. Even the town, now my nearest shopping centre, was different. No huge, sprawling new developments, just tidy little rows of ancient buildings, where the shops looked as though they had once been someone's front room, given a bigger window and a wider door. There were, reassuringly, no artisans to be seen. Even the shops which sold paint were utterly practical, displaying rows of tins with no recourse to shading or colour wheels. They looked far more as though they were used to selling to people who wanted to paint over stains and do up the shed, rather than highlight feature walls, and they'd have no truck with anyone who wanted to ombre anything. I went a bit overboard and started buying things with such abandon that shopkeepers called people in from the back room to watch. I bought paint, brushes, wood stain, several tins of something I wasn't quite sure about but was told it would make my floor look reet lovely. I also bought some overalls, industrial grade rubber gloves and a scraper. I think someone sold me a rubber doorstop and two rolls of electrical tape at one point but I was beyond caring by then. I loaded up the car, which sagged alarmingly over the back wheels, and drove back to the cottage ignoring the scary slopping noises from the boot and every indication that my rear suspension was dragging on the ground. Then I realised again that I needed water. I was going to have to bite the bullet and talk to my neighbour. I unloaded the car very, very slowly, in the hope that he might come out and ask what I'd been buying, or even offer to help me carry some of the more unwieldy items, but he didn't, which wasn't really a huge surprise given his thus far unsociable nature. Once the car was emptied, I hovered about outside my front door for a while, pretending to myself that I was admiring the view of the bare, thorny hedge and the field opposite, then pulled myself together and walked out of my front gate and through next doors. I tapped cautiously just above the no callers sign and then took several precautionary steps backwards so I was halfway down the path by the time the door opened. 
It says no callers. The voice came through the gap. Deep, slightly cracked, as though I'd woken him. Yes, I know it does. I just... What's so difficult to understand about it? No, the negative. Callers. People knocking. No callers. The exact opposite of what you are, in fact, doing. But he hadn't shut the door. Maybe he was enjoying keeping me out here in the cold. I need to know where the stopcock is, and I thought you would be able to tell me, I said quickly, in case he decided to slam the door. The estate agent told me to ask you, I added, in case he thought talking to someone this adversarial through a tiny sliver of part-open door was my way of enjoying myself. Otherwise, I wouldn't have disturbed you. Oh. The door edge wavered. My name's Tamsin Jones, I said, although I had no idea why I either wanted or needed to introduce myself. The stopcock is under the manhole, just outside your back door, he said. The door was beginning to close. Thank you. Oh, and would you happen to have the number of a local handyman? Only I need to build a run outside for Brack, for the fox, and I don't have a lot of tools. It suddenly occurred to me that I should have invested less in internal decoration and more in practical building materials. But it was too late now. A moment's silence and the edge of the door, which was all I could see, jiggled a bit. I'd prefer a female handyman, well, person, but I don't know if there are any out here. I was gabbling a bit now. I don't want just any strange man wandering around my house when there's only me, and it's quite isolated out here, isn't it? I finished, although I didn't really need his confirmation of the isolation of the only two houses for miles. A bit more of a pause, then the gap opened wider, and he stepped into it. Not actually over the threshold, but at least I could see who I was talking to now. The cottages weren't always isolated. I used to be a farm up here, he said. There's a bit of the old farmhouse left in your garden. He pointed to the overgrown bramble thicket, which clumped in the middle of the patch of ground at the side of my house. It waved back. But I haven't got any phone numbers to hand. Of handymen. Another pause, then...